And what I saw was just sheer carnage. There were people that were, were trapped but conscious and crying and completely bewildered. The unbelievable look of, of, on people's faces, that they, there they were sort of going to work and ending up in the middle of a major train crash. I was bleeding and I was aware that there was blood trickling down my face and across my eyes and so on. And I can remember hearing a few people um, groaning and crying, but overall it was almost eerily quiet. 35 people died in the Clapham Rail disaster. Others were horribly injured and trapped in the wreckage. All of them survived. They owed their lives to paramedics and doctors using a new approach to emergency medicine. Patients needed treatment where they lay, not in the hospital an hour or so later. And we realised that this golden hour was the time when patients lived or died depending on what treatment they had. At Clapham, doctors and ambulance workers brought care to the injured in the first vital hour after the accident. They saved lives that would have been lost years ago. Then, rescuers at disasters were helpless in what doctors now call the golden hour. The worst rail crash in post-war history happened here at Harrow back in 1952. Well, we went as usual to work that morning and it was a normal sort of morning for the time of year, misty. It was somehow, the train must have been a little late because the platform was quite crowded with people. And when the train did come in, all the seats were taken. It was packed. I was the first in, and I should think five people followed me, which would have been a total of 18 people in that compartment. Evelyn Hargood was one of 800 passengers packed into the local train to London. It was due to leave Harrow and Wealdstone Station at 8.20 on the 8th of October. It never did leave. Hurtling towards it was an express from Perth in Scotland. The driver missed the signal and smashed into the local train at 60 miles an hour. Moments later, a London to Manchester Express crashed into the wreckage. Everywhere was very dark at this point, and I screamed and screamed. And there was people groaning, not panicking, not screaming like I had been. They were saying, oh, get off of my face, or oh, help me. And just gentle murmuring, but people obviously in pain. And I remember thinking, I was dressed up that day and I had Cuban heels on. I remember thinking, oh, I hope my heels aren't in anybody's face. And when I got out, the realization was just unbelievable. The wreckage was piled up high. It was actually in the overhead bridge that goes from platform to platform. And I just looked and I just said, thank God. I couldn't believe that I'd been under that lot. Evelyn Hargood survived almost unscathed, but 112 people died in the crash and over 200 were seriously injured. The old wooden carriages of the local train had been turned to matchwood by the Perth to Euston sleeper. And then the London to Manchester train added to the carnage. Some people were killed instantly, but many others were trapped in the wreckage. The local fire brigades arrived within a few minutes of the crash but by modern standards, they were hopelessly ill-equipped to deal with disasters. I can only say my initial reaction was shock and horror, and how the hell, pardon the word, but how the hell are we going to get these people out? We have so limited equipment, breaking and entering tools, which are very basic, 
sledgehammers, crowbars, jemmy bars, this sort of thing, hand saws. So it was basically a little bit of brute force and a lot of hope we can get to this person before it's too late. floorboards of our coach were starting to catch fire because the Perth Express locomotive was immediately under our particular coach. I felt that uh, if I didn't get out immediately, I should be burnt along with many of the others. So I did feel you know, that it was a godsend that they lifted me out at that point. Arthur Collier was one of a number of survivors who made their own way to hospital. I got up and I walked out of Harrow Station, saw a 142 bus going to Watford, and I jumped on the bus and went into the hospital. I said, I've just come from the Harrow crash, and the sister who dealt with me said, Harrow crash? We haven't heard anything about Harrow crash. The ambulance service wasn't run by local health authorities in those days. In most places, it was run by the fire brigade. Communication with hospitals was haphazard, and ambulance crews were simply drivers with basic first aid certificates. They weren't supposed to treat the injured. Their job was to get them to hospital as quickly as possible. Harrow overwhelmed them. Well, when we arrived there, the mere sight of it, I just couldn't believe it. I said to my mate, Bob, what are we going to do? Where do we start? All we could use was a few bandages, triangular bandages, that sort of thing, stretchers. It was so bad that the, all the local residents were coming in trying to help, tearing up their sheets, the bandages, helping people out. And then we started to load as many as we possibly could to get them away to the nearest hospital. Jim Long was one of the first ambulance men to get there. Also quickly on the scene was a local movie tone cameraman who took this remarkable footage of the unfolding disaster. Much of it never before shown. He captured the chaos that the ambulance men faced as the injured streamed out of the wreckage. They all made for us swamped us with, uh, with casualties, which we had no control over. People walking into the ambulance, more seriously injured people that probably needed the ambulance more than some of the people we had on board, but we had no control over the situation at all. All we could do was proceed as fast as we could to the hospital. Tim Ely, the local superintendent, commandeered a furniture van the furniture van was loaded with the walking wounded and they were dispatched without too much fuss in the direction of Edgware General. The first inclination that the hospital had, there had been a major incident, was when this strange sight of a furniture van turned up outside the casualty and disgorged about 40 patients. Um, they knew they had problems from that time on. As the minutes ticked by, people were dying in the wreckage from shock and loss of blood. Local doctors were called by phone and loud hailer to come to the rescue. They brought whatever medicines they had to hand. I rushed off, grabbed some pethidine. I knew I had an emergency bag in the boot of the car and got to the station. I was horrified. It was a terrible sight of smoke and people and noise and screaming. And as I got in, Someone said to me, here, Doc, I suppose he realised I was a doctor carrying a bag, uh, is this chap dead? And he was dead. And from then on, I was called hither and thither to uh, see various victims. The doctors could only give painkillers and had to improvise ways of telling the hospital which people they'd treated. I gave pethidine to people in pain because pain increases the shock. 
and labelled those that had any injections. We didn't have anything special to do it with. We weren't expecting this sort of thing, but I had some plasters and labelled those and stuck them on. Although doctors worked heroically in the wreckage, they weren't equipped or trained to keep trapped survivors alive while they were being freed by the firemen. We could only see her head at first, uh, grey hair. No response from her whatsoever. For quite 10 minutes, quarter of an hour, we were burrowing our way through. And then we got down to within two feet from her, I would think, when she suddenly came alive, so to speak. She started talking to us, answering us. When we, and she became quite a, a bubbly lady in view of the situation she was in. Uh, when you get us out farming, I'm going to kiss you all, this sort of thing. Sadly, when we did get her out, she died there and then, before she was taken away, which... This was the sort of thing you were up against. By the end of the golden hour, the crucial first hour after a disaster, the rescuers were losing the Battle of Harrow. Survivors were dying, because the ambulance men were following the only policy they could, scoop and run, getting victims to hospital as fast as possible, hoping they didn't die on the way. We were regarded merely as removal men. Uh, as far as the fire service, as far as the general public was concerned, uh, they looked at an ambulance uh, as something that arrived with sort of screeching brakes, uh, very quickly loaded the patient on and disappeared in a cloud of smoke towards the local hospital. I'm sorry to say that in the haste and the rush to get casualties to hospital at Harrow and Wildstone, some would have died that need not. And I think that sort of scoop and run type uh, approach was something that we had to tackle head on as a post Harrow and Wildstone problem. Remarkably, at Harrow, there were medical teams who took a very different approach from the British Emergency Services. Called in from nearby air bases, Americans trained in battlefield medicine came to the rescue. They had brought plasma and employed a system called triage, sorting out the survivors according to the severity of their injuries. They were praised in the British medical press and admired by the local ambulance men. The Americans truly opened our eyes. They brought the hospital to the accident scene. They were able to concentrate on the more severely injured, to actually create a priority system in which patients should be dispatched to hospital, and so important, which patients should be retained at scene and stabilised, their condition stabilised. This was all new territory to us. We observed, we gawped, we wondered, and we admired. That had to be the way. The Americans had taught the British Emergency Services a lesson, but amazingly, after Harrow, it was soon forgotten. Scoop and Run lasted for another 30 years. The errors of Scoop and Run were repeated time and again, not just in train disasters, but in everyday accidents on the roads. Things only began to change when family doctors, voluntarily and totally unpaid, started to attend road accidents. They argued that Scoop and Run was costing lives. The whole philosophy was wrong, but it didn't make sense that patients who were ill at home with a tummy ache could call the doctor to come and see them. But if they were smashed to pieces in a road accident, then they had to get taken to the doctor for treatment. And we realised that patients were dying out there in the street for lack of fairly basic emergency care in the golden hour, the time between the accident happening and patients receiving definitive treatment in hospital. From the 1960s, a few family doctors began a new kind of emergency service. In 1977, they created BASICS, the British Association for Immediate Care. Red base, Delta Alpha 1, Red base, over. Delta Alpha 1, over. Delta Alpha 1, I'm mobile, the E18 area, over. Roger, I've got the high road, and we're going to be able to get you out of here. Yeah, I'm over.
Ken Hines was one of the first basics doctors in London. Now, there are 2,000 doctors in the scheme nationwide. They train and equip themselves and bring life-saving, on-the-spot medical care to the victims of accidents, offering something radically different from scoop and run. We had the philosophy of stay and stabilise. Stay at the scene long enough to stabilise the patient's condition, to make sure that by giving them early airways, giving them oxygen, giving them intravenous fluids, we could deliver them in a safe and stable way to hospital, and their chances of survival were much better. But basics doctors soon saw that their expertise wasn't enough. Ambulance workers were nearly always first to the scene of an accident, so they too needed training in emergency medicine. A long campaign led by the 1980s to the rise of the modern ambulance worker. Not just a driver, but a paramedic. Over 40 years, there'd been a quiet revolution in emergency medicine. Paramedics and basics doctors faced a major challenge of the terrible rail crash at Clapham in 1988. Faulty signalling had allowed an express to plough into a packed commuter train, and a third train had smashed into the wreckage. 35 people were killed and 500 injured. Travelling in the front carriage of the express was a doctor who miraculously survived. My side of the train effectively took the full brunt of the impact, and the only other vivid recollection I have is of being aware of the bags flying around the carriage and coming off the luggage racks. I know I was unconscious for about 20 minutes, and then I remember looking up and seeing that I was on the top of the wreckage because I could see the torn back roof of the train, which was almost like a can after a tin opener's been added. The whole thing had just kind of peeled back. And then the next thing I remember vividly seeing was a fireman who was taking videos, uh, pictures of, of the whole thing. You, you have to appreciate I was absolutely covered in blood from head to foot, and I was aware of this and was actually quite happy, if that's the right word, to be left there for a while while, while they dealt with people who are obviously a lot worse off than myself. The Clapham rescue was very different from the one at Harrow. Ambulance men and women worked inside the wreckage alongside firefighters. Long before the first doctors arrived, paramedics were treating survivors and sorting out those in most urgent need of care. And they were led by an ambulance incident officer, a figure unheard of at Harrow. I got there within about 11 minutes of the initial call on the radio. And when I arrived at the scene, um, it's true to say it was just absolute chaos. There were already the first ambulance crews and firemen treating some of the injured. Injuries absolutely horrific. Head injuries, blood, um, torn limbs. When you get human tissue against solid steel, um, it really leaves nothing to the imagination on the type of injuries that you saw. And it really was unbelievable. You look at things like that and you can't really believe that you're involved in it. It's that sort of scene. And yet, somewhere there was a sort of calmness, which I can't explain. Um, it's something I've experienced before, but it's a calmness after a major tragedy like that. Looking at such an incident, you feel a sickness in the pit of your stomach. Then you have to overcome that, because it's expected of you as an ambulance incident officer. You have to manage that incident. If one relates to the Harrow Wheelstone crash, which was really just go in, get them, and cart them away, being perfectly blunt. What we learned is to stand back, carry out triage, which is an assessment of casualties, their seriousness, and get them away in an orderly fashion. But one of the most important things is the ability to stabilize the patient's condition before you remove them. Most of the badly injured had been given on-the-spot care and taken to hospital within two hours of the disaster. 
but some were so badly trapped in the wreckage that it would take firefighters several hours to free them. It was the job of paramedics to keep them alive while they were rescued in almost impossible conditions. One man was found pinioned by his waist under 10 feet of mangled metal. His legs were hidden under the carriage floor. He was losing blood. A paramedic crawled under to investigate. It was quite obvious as, as I went under the carriage, just the extent of the um, people that hadn't survived. They were on the floor, unfortunately, uh, in pieces. I couldn't really work out which limbs belonged to which bodies but I managed to identify the actual leg and ankles that were trapped and started to work on the person from the bottom end. While Dobson worked below the man, a paramedic colleague tended him from above. He was semi-conscious. Um, he seemed to be in a great deal of pain, was very agitated and was thrashing about a great deal. He, um, it was obvious fairly quickly that he was um, not going to be released in a short period of time. One of the limbs was dangling down and it was moving around and I wasn't too happy about that. So in fact, managed to strap it off to the underside of uh, the other carriage and then try and impact part of the limbs with dressings to stop any blood that was coming out. 45 minutes after the crash, a team of four basics doctors arrived by police helicopter. They went to work alongside the paramedics, caring for those trapped and badly injured. One of the doctors was Ken Hines, who joined Dobson and Flaherty. There was considerable concern about his general condition, and his right leg was extremely badly mangled and, and crushed, and that was the source of the hemorrhage. He was bleeding very dramatically from that leg. It wasn't possible to get above the bleeding point to try and control it, so we couldn't put a tourniquet on, we couldn't even amputate the leg because we couldn't get high enough to control the bleeding. And so the only option was to give as much fluid as we could to replace the fluid that he was losing. We finally managed to lift the bogey up a great deal. We managed to move his leg out through the hole that was in the, the actual flooring and we started to inch him back towards the opening. The vessels, the blood vessels that have been trapped just almost exploded and before I knew where I was uh, the patient was pumping blood straight down on top of me. I put up a second drip um, and started to give him some more um, fluid to maintain his blood pressure. We gave him as much fluid as we possibly could through his veins, more than I've ever given to anyone before. I think he had eight bottles of, of a plasma expander followed by four units of blood. The man was released after an ordeal lasting four and a half hours. He had been treated where he was trapped. His life was saved before he reached hospital. His survival, as well as that of others at Clapham, was testimony to how far emergency medical care had advanced since Harrow in 1952. This was really the first time that we'd really been able in a major incident to have that sort of teamwork with the fire brigade, the ambulance crews and the doctors working together. And although we've done it regularly at road accidents, here we were applying the same principles in a major accident. I was pleased that we were able to save this guy and he did not die, yet still tinged, I think, with the sadness for those that we couldn't help on the day because they were just beyond all help. You're struck by the sadness and suddenness of it. Their life had just been snuffed out in very few seconds and in a, in a horribly traumatic way. You sort of temper that by the fact that your training's been brought into play and you've actually been able to make a difference.